Hi, everyone. And um, so welcome to my session on concept roof detection on malware analysis uh, on machine learning classifier. So I hope that you will enjoy the session and uh, uh, I hope that this will um, start off an interesting conversation and discussion either online or, or also offline. Um, okay, so um, let me just you know, switch on the share screen. So, and here now you should be having this slide deck. Okay, so today I would like to talk to you guys about um, a problem that is often quite neglected by the uh, computer security community when it comes about uh, applying machine learning, um, supervised machine learning, especially classification um, in malware detection and malware classification, okay? And uh, we'll see that this stems from the fact that usually we don't really have a metric that could tell us whether a prediction is reliable or unreliable. So we do have sometimes probabilities, but we'll see that probabilities are not always well suited to basically understand whether a prediction is reliable and therefore the classifier uh, would correctly classify an object or unreliable for, for the classifier will make mistakes. And we'll see you know, why this happens, right? Um, so this is a joint work with uh, many people that have been in my lab, uh, PhD students and postdocs. And uh, you can fetch the entire paper from uh, my lab, Systems Security Research Lab uh, webpage, and also uh, the paper has been published and presented using security process in the last August. Okay, so before talking about the problem itself, so let me just you know, give you a quick introduction on Royal Holloway about myself, so you might not have been here. So this is Royal Holloway, okay? So this is our founder's building, beautiful Victorian building, and uh, that was the main building of the university. Now, of course, the university expanded uh, a bit, but this is kind of, you know, our landscape. Um, so if you look at the people here, they're not, of course, magicians, uh, although they might look like, but they're part of the choir that is quite very renowned all over the world. So when it comes to Royal Holloway, it was funded in 1979 by Thomas Holloway, entrepreneur, philanthropist, uh, that was mostly well known for pills and ointment that Eventually, people find out research, find out that there was a, a paracetamol in the pills and ointment. So uh, it could actually cure diseases, like not arbitrary diseases, but it was actually very good. It's a medium science university, roughly 10,000 students um, across three different faculties, including the Faculty of Science that I belong to within the information security. It is conveniently located 40 minutes uh, direct train from central of London in a beautiful leafy campus. And, uh, this is a sign of pride. It's one of the 14 institutions that the government, UK government, recognized as Academic Center of Excellence in Cybersecurity Research since 2012. And we're home to one of the two uh, Center for the Third Training in Cybersecurity um, since 2012, and the other one uh, being hosted at Oxford University. Okay, so just a couple of words about myself. I'd like to start this with the Homer old school uh, um, icon. And a couple of names there, Antipode Research, Soft PJ, Graphics. So basically those are groups of people. I grew up in the, um, in the security community of the 90s and I met basically a bunch of guys and girls that share the same interests. So the underground research community. And uh, I'm really, really grateful to them because they started uh, um, instilling me the interest in security. And uh, that's why they are the first person, the first, the first people that I would like to, to thank uh, openly and publicly. So kudos to them. Thank you. And you know who you are and, and thank you for what you've done. And you continue to do this. Then uh, over the years, I, I realized that, you know, it would have been nice to have, you know, foundational understanding of computer science discipline. So I, I did the usual sort of open degree. So I have PhD in computer science from the University of Milan in Italy. And then uh, halfway through, so I started then uh, spending a bit of time in the United States and other parts of Europe. So I visited uh, Southwood University uh, during my PhD. Then you see Santa Barbara as a postdoc um, straight after that. And then as a postdoc again for a couple of years in Amsterdam, um, working more or less quite always on system security or system independence, right? So, and, um, and, and now I'm an associate professor of information security in the information security group here at Royal Holloway University of London. Um, so when I joined the group then in 2014, I uh, founded the System Security Research Lab. That is a lab, as the name suggests, that focuses on system security research. And in particular, it's a small lab that's been funded in September 2014. Um, 
with a small group of researchers between PhD students and undergraduate visiting scholars and postdocs. There are 10 people roughly floating around. And it's a, it's a good size for me because I'm pretty pretty much hands-on on the research that happens in the lab, so I wanted to keep it this way. And the underlying theme is basically to build on program analysis and machine learning to uh, deal with threats uh, to the security of systems. And there have been a couple of uh, theme projects that we've been exploring in, in the past and currently around onboard security, malware analysis and detection, vulnerability discovery, and automatic exploit generation, just to name a few. Okay. Um, I'm grateful to a number of um, sponsors that funded the research that happened in the lab. And you can find here in the slide a few of them. Um, there's a few highlights of what happened in the lab in the past year and this year. Uh, we've been just working, as I mentioned before, on malware analysis and, and challenges that you might find in applying machine learning classifiers to the, to the problem space. Uh, we've also been working in collaboration with our university to um, software hardening and, and and specifically in boundary checking and enforcing uh, uh, bounds checking. Then uh, we've been working on vulnerability discovery. And the last piece of work that we just uh, uh, published in the workshop of CCS is, or, is on automatic exploit generation for key vulnerabilities. Um, so when it comes about now getting to the problem, right? So when it comes about machine learning uh, classification, so it, it is generally, the problem is generally characterized by two different and distinct uh, phases, a training one and a testing one. So the training phase, generally, uh, given the number of labeled uh, data, we would like to fit this data to an underlying mathematical model that we believe describe the data uh, at its best, okay? And uh, uh, during the testing phase, once we were trained the model, during the testing phase, we want to see whether a new, previously unseen object uh, fits basically into this model or it doesn't, okay? So whether we can predict whether an object belongs to a model or not. And the model can be used to make regression or classification. In our, in our, in our uh, context, we'd just be looking at classification. It could be binary classification or multi-classification. So we would like to see whether an object belongs to a class or another class, being malicious, benign, or different families. Objects are described as vectors of features, which means that given an object, this is a bit of a generalization, of course, because with, with neural networks, things are slightly different, but usually with traditional machine learning, supervised machine learning, given an object, we need to abstract, in a sense, the raw data to identify features, attributes that could describe the data at best, and then populate um, a feature vector for each of these objects during training so that we can build our mathematical models. We can fit this uh, training data set to the model. And then during testing, we do similarly, we extract features out of the object that we want to make a prediction of, and then we just run a class the classifier to see whether the classifier tells us, okay, the object is benign or benign, and why, hopefully, okay? So ideally, if you see, um, if, you, if you had been tasked with classifying uh, Pokemon, for instance, okay, just forget, for a second, then we'll talk about images because we know that deep learning uh, or communicational network, neural network experiences work particularly well for image classification problems where the feature space is sort of, you know, um, um, inferred by different or, or picked up by different layers in the network. In the normal machine learning classification setting, if we're using other type of algorithm, we will need to describe in terms of attributes these objects. So for instance, if we look at Pikachu uh, on the uh, left-hand side, we we'll like to see, okay, there is, uh, you know, um, one feature could be a uh, number of years, and it could be you know, two in this case. But for instance, for Charman there on the right-hand side, uh, it has no visible years, okay? And then we can see, okay, whether the tail has a, uh, has a flame or not. And of course, you know, for Pikachu, this is negative, so it will be a feature of zero, and for the other one, it will be with a flag, and so forth and so on. So you, you get the point. So we need to describe this object with uh, a vector of, of number in principle, you know, to make it simple, okay? And ideally, the features that we pick are discriminatory, so we can use them to distinguish between the two different classes. We can use a machine learning model that one, once it's trained with all the data, can distinguish between the two classes. So ideally, we would like something that basically identify uh, um, the best separating uh, line or hyperplane in multi-dimension that sets the two classes apart, okay? So this is very simple introduction. The problem is that in a non-stationary context, 
we have the behavior, we have our objects, the properties, the statistical properties of our objects that change over time, okay, in unforeseen ways. For instance, if we if we keep the analogy of the Pokemon, uh, if we follow the analogy of the Pokemon, in, in this slide you see that we have Hitmon Lee, that is a new Pokemon family. So we haven't seen this before, which means that if we don't train the classifier on this specific family, whenever we want to test an object that belongs to the family, it is very much likely that the classifier makes a mistake, make, makes a mistake, because the classifier has been trained on two classes, uh, Pop, um, it was uh, Pikachu and, um, and uh, Charmander, and there's no Pikmin Lee family. So for any of those objects, the classifier will make a wrong prediction, okay? However, even for objects that we've seen, those objects can evolve, in particular, we can have Raichu, that is an evolution of Pikachu, and we can have Chameleon, that is an evolution of Charmander, okay? So again, depending on the features that we use, the classifier underneath might actually be able to make the correct predictions or not, because the statistical properties of the objects that we're trying to describe change in unforeseen way. Or we can even find objects that we haven't seen before, like belonging to completely different this is a problem of concept. So we're drifting away from the variables we're trying to model, the concept, okay? And this is particularly true, not in many uh, domain, but particularly true in a security domain. And again, particularly true in machine, uh, sorry, in, in, a, in a malware uh, classification and detection problem, where you do have the properties of the malware that evolve over time, the behavior of the malware that evolve over time. You have new threats that are coming up all the time, okay? So this means that, if we train a model on enough data, even if the model performs fairly well in a closed lab setting, in a K-fold cross validation setting, whenever we deploy the model, it is fairly much likely, it is very much likely that eventually the model will start decaying because we'll start observing objects that we haven't seen before or objects that we've seen before, but their properties, their statistical properties have changed over time. So in this context, it'll be interesting to see whether we can have a quality metrics that can tell us hey, look, these objects you're observing at this stage that you are classifying belongs to this specific class because the classifier tells you what a class, okay? But it'll be interesting to have a quality metric that tells um, a system or an analyst, hey, please, do trust the classifier uh, prediction because I have this quality metric that support the classification. On the other hand, we would like to see for drifted objects a quality metric that tells either an analyst or a system, please do not consider this prediction. Because if you do consider the prediction in deployment, you will make a mistake. You will likely make a mistake, okay? And here you can see an example of how um, him only was incorrectly classified regardless of the class, and also how it could happen that the two different samples were correctly classified, for instance, for uh, Chamandler, uh, but not for the evolution of the uh, okay? Of course, the problem exists that in, so this is an example that takes a two-class classification, but we can have, we can generalize, and the problem exists also in a multi-class classification setting, okay? The more families, the more evolution, uh, the more tricky it becomes to actually uh, generalize to capture the behavior of uh, all the samples um, for good, right? Okay, so to summarize, in a non-stationary context, the classifier will suffer for constant drift because of evolution of the malware. So the same object that we had before changed the statistical property underneath. As a specific example, think about um, a piece of malicious software that contacts a command and control server, the botnet that contacts a command, a command and control server. And let's assume that this is a DGA. So it's, a, it's an automatically generated domain names that contact over time a specific server, okay? It is very much likely that this specific name would change over time as because it's automatically generated by an algorithm. If we use as a feature to identify the sample, I'm, I'm you know, stretching the example here, but if you use as a feature to identify the object, the domain name um, that is that the, that the malware contacts over time, well, of course, you know, we'll be able to classify as malicious any malware that contact a specific domain, but whenever the domain changes, that feature is something that property, the statistical property of the feature changes, and it's something that we won't be able to correctly classify. And the problem, of course, you know, appears if we have malware values. So 
In a nutshell, we need a way to assess the predictions of classifiers, okay? And ideally, this is something desirable, we would like to have something that is classifier agnostic. Okay, okay. so we would like something that works regardless of the underlying classifier, whether it is SVM, whether it is random forest, whether it is perhaps even deep learning, if we have some form of score that the deep learning uh, network can provide, and so forth and so on. Okay, so in terms of contribution, this is what we try to, uh, the question we try to answer to. And we propose conformal evaluator as a statistical evaluation framework of machine learning classifiers. And the framework is able to provide quality metrics for, um, for machine learning classification tasks that is agnostic to the underlying algorithm as long as the machine learning process produces a score. So this could be the distance from an hyperplane in case of SVM, for instance. It could be the distance from a centroid. It could be um, a probability uh, in case of random forest or deep learning with a softmax layer and so forth and so on. Once we build a framework that provides this statistical evaluation, um, then we turn the problem into an, op an optimization problem to identify a suitable threshold, this quality threshold that enables us to basically tell us whether a prediction is likely reliable or not. And if not, we suggest basically not to trust the classifier in the process because it will likely make a mistake when uh, classifying the object. Okay, so let's have a look at you know how everything works uh, under the hood a little bit better. So to assess the decision made by the classifier, the, the the point is that to mark its decision, its prediction as reliable or unreliable. To do this, we basically build so confirm by to builds and uses p values that are needed for uh, producing the quality metrics that we're talking about. Then once we have p-values for every object that we see um, in our training and calibration data set, we can then identify a per-class threshold that divides reliable decision from unreliable decision. Okay? We will see a little bit better how this works in, in, in a nutshell. So if you if you think intuitively speaking, and this is you know, the only you know, math that you see here, but intuitively speaking, um, the p-value in our case tells us basically how good or how well a particular object fits into a given class. So we expect to have a high p-value for objects that fit very well to the class. So to the underlying probability distribution that we don't know anything about, of course, we're trying to, not to estimate, but we're trying actually to uh, infer this, um, this state by looking at the distribution of p-value. And for those that do not really fit well into the class, we would expect to, to find a low value. Now, the tricky part of the optimization problem that we solve is to find the sweet spot between a high and a low value pressure. Okay? And then we do rely on a non-conformity score for any object and for any class that basically it's something that is derived by the underlying algorithm. Okay? So if we rely on SVM, for instance, which is an algorithm that creates the best separated hardware plane from two classes in principle, you can find that the non-conformity score is the distance of an object from the hardware plane. With a little adjustment of changing the sign to the negative, because we're interested not in a conformity, so in how similar we are, we're interested in a non-conformity, so how dissimilar we are, okay? And the p-value basically captures the ratio of elements that are as similar in a class as the object that we're trying to test uh, currently, okay, over either all the objects that we have in our data set or all the objects in the class. Okay, let me just explain you a uh, little example how this works, okay? So I'm, I'm trying to simplify a little bit uh, the problem space. So let's assume that as a machine learning classifier, we consider the distance from the centroid. And let's assume that we have three classes as depicted in, in the slide, okay? So um, triangles, green triangles, uh, blue circles, and red uh, squares, okay? And they are represented through features that map to a geometric space. And this is the way that, you know, we do see the, uh, the object on an Euclidean space, okay? Let's assume now that, uh, and those are all labeled. So this is a, it's, a, it's a supervised machine learning task. So those objects are labeled as I just mentioned. So now let's assume that we have a new object, a test object this gray star. We want to understand, you know, where, where this object belongs to, assuming that the machine learning classifier underneath is the distance from the center. 
Okay, so we need to compute for each class the centroid. In this case, it is represented by this uh, uh, for the blue class by this um, a blue cross. And we identify basically the decision boundary uh, that is defined by the radius uh, of this distance from the center. And now, because we want to understand, we want to build this p value, and the p value is built as um, counting how many objects are as dissimilar as the test object that we're trying to classify. Now, in this case, if you count the object, you can see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine objects out of 10. So this is the 10th object. So nine objects are as dissimilar as or more the objects that we're trying to classify over 10 objects in the class. So in this case, the p-value is just the ratio of this p-number. So we have nine and then the p-value is nine over 10. So in a sense, the statistical support of the quality of saying that the, this new object belongs to the class blue is nine over 10, so it's pretty high. So we do the same basically for the class green and we find that it's four over 12 and for the class red and we find that it's zero over 11 because all the objects are actually less dissimilar than the one we're trying to classify. Okay, so this is just a statistical support that we give for testing object for every class that we can classify the object into. Okay, and the underlying machine learning classification algorithm is this from the center. Now let's see how these two values are used within conformal algorithm. Okay, now as we mentioned before, the first step is to extract the non-conformity measure from the decision-making algorithm. In the previous example, I mentioned the distance from the centroid, and that already captures a, a, a concept of dissimilarity. If we have other algorithms, for instance, the distance from the hyperplane in SVM, we need to adjust that because the distance from the hyperplane um, that captures similarities, and then we have to have a negative sign uh, to, to make it up for the dissimilarity we're, we're looking for. Similar reasoning for probabilities as output from random forest, for instance. Okay? So this is the first thing that we do, and we build this non-conformity measure out of the machine learning algorithms that is used to make the prediction. Okay, so this is where the agnostic, algorithm agnostic comes from. Then, once we have all the scores of all the objects uh, under examination, we we'll build p-values for all the training samples in a cross-validation evaluation fashion. So in this case, because we want to have p-values for all the objects, we use the leave one out as a cross-validation sample so that we can give a p-value for all the objects. And then at this point, we have all the p-values. So we have p-values for every object for every class. And again, every object has um, a certain number of p-values that equal the number of classes that we have in our, in our training of uh, data set. And then at this point, we compute a per-class threshold that is used to give this quality of the prediction. So every prediction that falls, uh, that has a p-value during testing that is above this threshold is considered to be reliable, and all of those that fall below are considered to be unreliable, okay? Now, this is an optimization problem. So basically we can decide to optimize either a desired performance uh, from a machine learning task perspective, like F1 score for instance, or the number of elements that we would like to retain um, uh, once we deploy the algorithm. Okay, so these thresholds are computed by using the calibration data set, okay? So this is the desired performance, for instance. There is no guarantee that we can obtain this performance once we deploy the model. Why? Because if all the objects that the model is fed with are all drifting away, so there are all new classes or there are no old variation of um, previously seen uh, malware, then they will have a very low value that is below this quality threshold. Therefore, we will mark, the confirm evaluator will mark all these predictions as unreliable. The reason is well justified because if we would leave the underlying algorithms to make a decision and to consider the decision, we will be likely making mistakes because that will become like more of a chance of making the right prediction or not. And we'll see this in the evaluation later on, okay? So, uh, well, this is just a way to, to um, again, summarize what we just mentioned before. So for every object we then in a, in a cross-validation setting, we keep track of the p-values of correct decisions and the p-values of the incorrect decisions. And then we solve this uh, optimization problem where we do find this sweet spot. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, experimental results. So 
Of course, it's it's quite empirical. So so the the underlying theory of conformal evaluator is is sort of borrowed by conformal predictor, and you'll read more about this in the papers if you're interested in. So there is there is some some theoretical background here. But of course, you know the way that we try to evaluate it is is pretty much empirical. So uh, there are no proofs, of course, that this will work regardless. It makes you know intuitively sense at least to me. But of course, you know there is no overclaim here uh, naturally. So, however, we did try to evaluate our approach in different settings. So, binary, binary classification settings and multi classification settings. And also on Android malware, therefore, their specific feature space, and on Microsoft malware, so best of malware uh, that present a completely different feature space. And also on different algorithms. So, for the Android malware, it's linear SVM, and for um, the Microsoft um, classification, multi class classification problem, that came out of the Kaggle competition, uh, we use a uh, random forest as the underlying classification algorithm and also as a non-conformity measure. Okay? And in the former case, the binary case study, the concept scenario is now evolution. And for the multi-class classification case study, the concept scenario is family discovery. Okay? Here in the slide deck, we have um, a few references on, on that would provide you more information on the approaches that we evaluated. Okay, so we did wanted to evaluate just you know existing approaches that achieved very high uh, and very good results. So the former one, for instance, for the Android malware detection algorithm, it's called Draven, was published in NGSS, the top tier venue in computer security uh, in 2014. And uh, we implemented the algorithm and we, we got access to the data set that the author provided to us. And features are statically extracted uh, from Android applications. Um, and there is a, an underlying linear SDN. Precision and recall for malicious, for the positive class that is malicious, is 0 0.95, 0 0.92 respectively, so which is pretty uh, good and interesting. And this is the number that you know, we want to keep as a, as a reference point. Okay? So because of lack of time, I don't want you to um, bother me with also multi class communication case. I'll be more than happy to answer questions to show a couple of plots uh, in this case as well, but uh, more information is in the now, so let's just focus on the binary case, um, uh, uh, case study on Android malware uh, detection, basically. So this is um, a summary of the data set that we've been used, uh, that we've used for running the experiment. So the first data set came straight from the trading paper. So samples collected from 2010 and 2012, and roughly 128,000 samples, 123,000 benign, and 5,000 malicious ones. Okay, then we use also um, the Marvin data set and we have, um, a link to the paper that describes the data set um, uh, that was um, kindly uh, shared with us um, uh, by uh, Martina Lindorfer. Um, and uh, so the Marvin data set has malicious applications and the applications that are collected from 2010 to 2014. Of course, you know, we make sure to remove duplicates between the two data sets. So the idea is to use the Brevin data set to train our algorithm and then the Marvin data set to, to evaluate the concept. Rate. As you notice, there is an overlap in terms of time frame uh, between the Drevin and Marvin data set. But also there is some there are there are a couple of years that I haven't been covered by the Drevin data set. And the hope is there to find a drift. So in terms of malware evolution, and I forward to show how the algorithm, the original algorithm, cannot keep up with it and only with the quality metrics were able to understand whether predictions are reliable or not, okay? And the breakdown of the Marvin data set of, the, of, of an excerpt of the Marvin data set is given on the right-hand side. So roughly 10,000 benign sample and 10,000 malicious sample. Okay. For the first experiment, we just trained uh, the, a linear SVM with features that are statically extracted by the binaries. And those features include, for instance, uh, uh, APIs, that are invoked by the, by the binary strings, so you can find the binary and so on and so on. And that comes straight from the data dataset. For a testing dataset, we split the original Marvin dataset into uh, of roughly equal, um, equal size, 4,500 benign and 4,500 malicious random samples. And these, are, these have been randomly sampled over the whole time frame, 2010 to 2014. So the idea is actually now, this is our testing dataset, and we feed it to the train classifier. As you can see here, many samples, 2,890 samples, have been misclassified as benign. 
Um, so these are all false positives. So assuming that the malicious class is the positive class, which basically from a 0.95 precision we had before in the K4 consolidation, it brings down the precision to 0.61, okay? The reason is that, well, because there are some of the malware that are in the Marvin data set have the same statistical properties of those that were in the Gradient data set, but others uh, have completely different statistical properties. Now, you can see this in the number, but we also try to visualize this. This is a T-SNE plot, which basically tries to plot in a two-dimensional, high-dimensional space with some stochastic guarantees that if two points are close in a higher dimensional space, they also be drawn close in a two-dimensional space. As you can see here, so the Marvin malicious samples are the blue circles. Some of them are actually quite close to the Gradient malicious samples. So some of them are have similar features in terms of values also, but others are kind of you know, scattered here and there, you see. And these are those that would be not correctly classified. And if we overlay also the benign sample, we see clearly how those will be misclassified as benign samples. So this is a way to show the concept if that is happening and it leads to false positives because the benign samples are actually close more to the other. I mean, with the exception, of course. Um, it's a still a statistical approach. Now, what we try to do is, okay, let's use conform evaluator, what we just mentioned before. Let's solve the optimization problem as the function we try to maximize is the F1 score during the calibration and training sentence. So, and we set as a desired F1 score, 0 0.99, okay? This is, and then we basically obtain a p-value as a quality threshold that sets apart um, reliable and unreliable predictions in this desired setting, okay? Now we try to enforce this, so we have a classifier, but before then considering the classification to be correct, uh, to be uh, um, correct, uh, we actually try to understand whether the p-value uh, associated with this object point is above or below our quality metrics. If it's above, then we consider this as a, a reliable classification, and then we count whether a classifier was correct or not. This is a label data set, okay? So if it's correct, it's a true positive. If it's not correct, it's a false one, okay? We're talking just about malicious samples, but similar reasoning holds for benign samples, okay? Now, you can see that just by enforcing this quality metric, we are able to boost the precision and therefore reduce the false positive rate. So we were able to boost the precision to 0 0.89, so roughly 0 0.90, which is pretty interesting. So it was 0 0.95 originally, then before, then it dropped down with a constant rate to 0 0.61, and then now we're just enforcing this quality threshold is 0 0.89. So this happened because conform evaluator marked some of the prediction as unreliable, and basically we had to quarantine some of the objects, because if we had considered them, the classifier would have made likely a wrong prediction, affecting the precision of the overall process, and we've seen in the previous slide, okay? Now, if we can label the objects that have been, that belongs to predictions that are unreliable, and then we retrain the model, and we use a different testing data set, then we can see here that we can reboost the precision and the call, to the original, roughly to the original values, okay? So this is just, you know, to conclude the picture and the whole pipeline, but of course, you know, relabeling the samples that are marked as, a, as unreliable a prediction, it's a challenging problem on itself because of course, this is tied to the resources that we have at our disposal to uh, uh, label new samples. And this is a, a, an open problem, something we're working on at the moment, okay? Now, an interesting point is, to understand there are other metrics that might enable us to take this decision, this quality decision. One of which is uh, uh, probability, for instance. So we did actually perform a couple of experiments on uh, the two different case studies. So we used probabilities for random forest um, and, and we treated in the same way of our value in terms of the you know, optimization problem to identify interesting suitable uh, quality threshold. And we did the same for uh, the binary classification case, because we have a linear SVM, we use a uh, scaling to obtain probabilities, okay? Now, if we look at the central tendency and dispersion points of the true positive distribution, so which is basically the first column over here, and we look at, just by considering the first quartile, for instance, of the distribution, 
what is the true positive rate of predictions that we mark as reliable? Then we see that by using our matrix, so matrix that is derived by the pre value, we have a true positive rate of 90%. Well, if we enforce a, a matrix that is derived by the, S, the, the, the flat scaling of SPM, so a probability, we have 66%. So this means that already probability discards, in a sense, samples, objects, that, should, that would have been classified correctly by the classifier. And this happens because probabilities are, unless they are perfectly or well calibrated, they, are, they tend to be skewed to be on the high part, even for wrong predictions or for correct predictions. So this is why we don't believe it's actually that they can always be um, suitable for this case. The most interesting bit, however, so here you can see that already by enforcing a, a, a quality metric that is derived by p-value, so from the variable we just proposed in this work, we can achieve already a higher true positive rate, okay, on the predictions that are reliable. The interesting bit, however, is to understand, okay, what is, the, however, the true positive rate on the predictions that are unreliable? In other words, are you marking some of the predictions of the classifier as unreli unreliable? even though the classifier would have made a good, a, good, a good prediction. If so, then the approach is you know, a bit of a, a, bit of a uh, failure in a sense, because uh, we're discarding in a way objects that we would have still classified correctly, okay? So if you look at this, uh, sorry, this case here, you see that in our case, so with a threshold that is derived by p-value, so compare evaluator, the true positive rate on the objects that belong to unreliable predictions are zero. So which means that none of those objects would have been classified correctly by the classifier had we let them through. On the other hand, if you look at the probability, unfortunately, we have 31% of true positive rate, which means that objects that belong to unreliable prediction as derived by the probability but scaling on SEM in this case, would have been classified 31% of them, would have been classified correctly by the classifier. So we have discarded something that we shouldn't have, okay? So in a way, and you can follow a similar reason for, for full stop the rate of reliable prediction and unreliable prediction. So in a way, it seems, again, we've done you know, just um, a bit of experiment, but more exhaustive experiments are, are due. It seems that this p-value, this, this statistical matrix that we build by using the underlying algorithms uh, that is used for the classification task seems to be more suitable to identify possible identity. So as a conclusion, uh, we have proposed something we call conform evaluator, that is a statistical evaluation framework for assess predictions of machine learning classifiers that is used in this specific case to identify concept. Yeah. There are other cases that we believe could be useful, but in this specific case, it's just to identify concept. If you want to read more about the papers or some details on, on also multicast application or things I couldn't mention here, please catch it from uh, Estelab uh, website. And uh, the key point here is that the approach that we propose, it, it, it's algorithm agnostic. So it uses a non-conformity measure that is derived strictly from the machine learning classifier. So if you use something that outputs a score, we believe it could be useful for building the statistical methods that it can be used then to provide quality for prediction. We haven't tried, but one interesting bit that we would like to explore um, further is to uh, take probabilities as output from a softmax layer in, in neural networks and understand whether we can still build p-values and identify concept with uh, and so on and so on. And not just from our classifier, but also for other uh, more traditional, in this case, for Deep neural network tasks such as image classification. Um, what we build is a statistical support of the prediction of the of the of the classifier, and this enables us to build thresholds that identify unreliable prediction and therefore likely uh, concept. We have evaluated this on different machine learning classifiers and case studies to try to be as generic as possible. We're far from claiming that it works, you know. Well, good, then we have solved the problem. I don't believe we have, but I believe this is actually a quite interesting step forward um, to, to the problem space. If you want to read a bit more about the project itself, here's the URL, stulab.isg.rhul.ac.uk slash projects slash CE. And uh, uh, it'll be interesting, for instance, to understand whether this could be useful, useful to um, either generate or identify adversarial 
uh, samples of the machine learning, which in a way it might be seen as an artificial concept uh, But of course, you know, this is uh, part of our research roadmap, and I'll be more than happy to discuss it with you guys. Thank you very much. It'll be a pleasure to talk to you about um, our recent uh, work. Thank you. So I'll be more than happy to take uh, questions now. So I'll stick around for a little bit. Um, if you want some individual private session, please book them on the on the website. If I have to rush off, I apologize in advance, uh, but feel free to uh, drop me a line via email. Um, so my, my email is lorenzo.cavallaro at rhgl.acuk, where you'll find everything on SLAB website. And uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter or just do it via Thank you very much. Okay, so let me just go back uh, to the comments. Okay, it looks like Hogwarts. Um, yes, in a way. So for Royal Hogwarts, yes. Um, Harry Potter, uh, Robert Potter, sure. Um, so there's a question that says, you know, how can malware keep up with the current threats? So I, I'm not entirely sure where I get the question, but in a way, um, so malware evolved constantly, but not just the behavior that we might think of, like as human being, but also as you as you notice, in the process of machine learning, so we need to abstract away a, a, a binary. Uh, with some information that describes the binary. This could be a sequence of APIs that the binary executes, for instance. Uh, we can do more sophisticated models that will build information flows and so forth and so on. So, but basically, if our feature engineering is not really robust against uh, history, uh, the, the time that progresses by, uh, then we will suffer from this concept. I mean, in principle, it's natural to have concept break. Um, in our domain, the interesting bit would be to have something as transcend or component evaluator that basically tells you, hey, you know, something weird is going on with this object. Do not trust the classification, so you have to do something else. Then for other objects that fit into the train model, please keep on trusting the classifier. If you had good results in a K4 customization setting, so in closed lab settings, you should be having the same one. So everything that fits into the probability distribution that we don't know, this one. So I have another quick question here that says, you know, does transcend favor an operating system in the case studies? Um, uh, not really. So, so we we wanted to show again to, to show that we were a bit generic in a way. We um, we looked at the binary classification uh, case study for Android malware, um, linear SVM, and then multi-class classification case study for uh, Windows uh, malware. Uh, so I think find identification of families for um, a random forest underlying uh, machine learning algorithm for the other use case study. Um, we found all different. So there are two different settings. So in one, we wanted to highlight that transcend and conform evaluator detects concept rate in binary classification case studies with these algorithms, but also we wanted to show that you, we can identify new families. So is let me just. Uh, um, let me just uh, show you, uh, let me just maybe share for a second again the screen. So here, for instance, if we have, if we look at the um, Microsoft Malware Classification Challenge, these are uh, an excerpt of the data set. So the families, Ramnik, Lollipop, Helios, uh, Bungo, blah, 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 and the samples that we have per family. Uh, and then we decided to take one of the family out. From our training data set. So we trained the random forest on random on these families you see up here, and the testing family. So we, we uh, omit from the training data set all the objects that belong to the track root family. Okay. And as a classification result, this is the confusion matrix. Okay. So these objects have been misclassified five times as Lollipop, uh, which is not Android, it's just the name of the family for Windows malware. Um, six times as Kelios, uh, 358 times as Bundo, and so forth and so on, okay? The reason is because the features that they have, uh, they're very much similar for Bundo and, and for, rather than uh, Kelios version 3 and so forth and so on. However, if we look at the p-value distribution, okay, we see that the p-value that belongs to the tracker family, so the testing family that we have kept outside, if we try to classify it is, is as any of the family that we had in our training data set, we have a very, very, very low p-value, almost zero, for all of the objects, for all the families. 
this clearly identifies that this is a family that we haven't seen before. This is a new stuff. So please do not consider the prediction because you will make a mistake. You would likely misclassify this malware as Bundo or Helios version one or Obfuscator or blah, 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 okay? So um, we, 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 we tested that on multiple classification case study and it works uh, perfectly uh, also for our case. And again, you know, I'll be more than happy to follow up with you guys um, offline, whatever it is. Uh, for the time being, thanks for being here with me. Bye.